Hello and welcome. I'm coming to you from beautiful Victoria, BC, Canada, along the harbour at the Bateman Gallery. To start off, I would like to acknowledge that we have the honour to live, work and play on the traditional lands of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I am Carrie Lynn Link, the Head of Learning for the Bateman Foundation for the past five years. Today we are coming to you on Action Anxiety Day on behalf of Anxiety Canada, one of our partners here at the Bateman Foundation. We truly believe in the importance of art in nature to one's well-being. Spending time in nature, focusing on being in the moment, mindfulness, observation, creativity, and the act of self-expression through art. The Bateman Foundation is a registered charity dedicated to, the ed to educating the public on the importance of human nature connection. Founded by renowned artist and naturalist Robert Bateman, we use art to understand our environment and unlock creativity. Through public programs, community, community collaborations, and exhibits at the Bateman Gallery, we foster mutually beneficial relationships between humans and our environment. Nature Sketch is our flagship educational program with a curriculum inspired by Robert Bateman's artistic practices and personal philosophies. We encourage individual connection to nature through art and creativity. When you draw something, you truly look at it. Nature Sketch students learn to pay attention and understand the value of the natural world. We're going to start our session today with a visualization meditation. Hello, Nature Sketch students. My name is Caitlin McManus. I am the art therapist working with the Bateman Foundation. I will be leading you through a visualization of a relaxing forest walk. You are invited to use your imagination to fill in the details as I guide you down the path. This path may look familiar to you, or it may be somewhere new, but it should be relaxing for you. Let's begin. I invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you or gently look downward in front of you. Allow your body to begin to relax and take a deep breath in. Notice if there are any tight places in your body and try to relax and release them as you slowly breathe out. <sighs> now, I invite you to take another deep breath in. And if it feels good for you, let out a sigh on your out-breath, letting go of everything that's happened today. <sighs> Imagine you're sitting on a sun-warmed, comfortable rock supported by the earth beneath you. You're in an open, sunny field at the edge of a beautiful and welcoming forest. You breathe in the fresh, cool forest air, filling your lungs completely. Now exhale, breathing out all the air, feeling refreshed in this perfect sunny spot. Ah. Letting your body relax even further. You can hear birds singing and their songs around you and a gentle breeze rustling the leaves. You take a moment to close your eyes and enjoy these sweet sounds with the warmth of the sun on your face. You feel very calm and connected to nature around you. You're meant to be here and are exactly where you're supposed to be right now. There's nothing to do but simply relax and enjoy nature around you. You look toward the trees and notice a path at the edge of the forest. You decide to get up and go for a walk. As you begin to walk towards the forest path, you feel a gentle and welcome breeze on your cheek. And you can hear the soft rustle of leaves swaying in the cool breeze. 
You continue to breathe slowly and deeply as you walk through the forest. The air is cool, but comfortable. Sun filters through the trees, creating a beautiful pattern of soft light on the path in front of you. As you continue walking, you begin to swing your arms as, it, as you walk, and they become loose and even more relaxed at your sides. You're fully supported by the beauty of nature and can feel any last bit of tightness leaving your body now. As you admire the forest, enjoying the protection of the canopy of the trees above you. You begin to notice that the forest has so many different colors, shapes, and textures. You see moss, ferns, and other small plants along the sides of the path, reaching up towards the light. Leaves crunch beneath your feet as you walk along. The air smells crisp and fresh and you can detect a faint smell of soil and cedar with each soft step. It's lovely to be out enjoying a walk. You feel so connected and whole and welcome in this special forest. You can see so many different shades of green. Some of the leaves on the trees are a deep green and others are very light green color, almost shimmering yellow green in the dappled sun breeze. The soft beams of sunlight are gentle and soothing in the safety of the cool forest. The earth beneath your feet is soft and dry and comforting to walk on. There are wide and tall old trees and younger, small and slender ones. In the variety of trees, you notice many different textures in their bark. You reach out and touch some cool, smooth bark and then some bark that's rough to the touch with deep grooves and an interesting pattern to trace with your finger. There's soft silvery colored bark, dark brown, and so many different colors in between. You pause here to smell the forest around you. The fresh forest air is full with the scent of soil, trees, and a nearby stream. You can hear the faint sound of trickling water in the distance. It's not too far down the path, so you decide to walk on to discover its source. You come to a stream and listen to the calming sound of the water gently pouring and flowing over the rocks. The sun glints off the water casting bright dancing spots of light on the trees around you. The sound of bubbling water relaxes you even further. You reach down to feel the cool water on your hands and feel totally refreshed. <sighs> Any remaining thoughts or worries from your day seem to be washed away downstream by the water's gentle flow. Feeling fully at one with nature and grateful for having spent some time in this special place, you look fondly back at the path that brought you here and start your journey back. As you walk back, many of the trees are familiar to you. You see the light from the field at the entrance of your path up ahead. You come to the entrance. You stop for a moment to take in the sights, sounds, and smells of the forest once more. Knowing that you can visit this special place in your imagination again anytime you like. This is a relaxing place that's just for you, where you can be fully yourself, just as you are. Finally, you walk out of the forest and find yourself back in the open sunny field that you started in. We've come to the end of our journey together today. And as you return to your nature sketch class, I invite you to keep the feeling of calm, relaxation, and lovely connection to nature that you may have experienced during this visualization. You can now open your eyes and slowly look around you at your surroundings, noticing the room around you, beginning to feel more alert and refreshed. You can wiggle your fingers and toes, shrug your shoulders, or have a little stretch if you want to and fully come back to the room. 
Thanks for joining me in this visualization today, and I hope you enjoy your nature sketch class. Today we're going to spend some time counting sheep. Here are a few paintings and sketches by Robert Bateman. He's got some pencil sketches here, some, he works a lot in pen and ink when he's outside sketching. These ones are more finished drawings done in pencil as well as his traditional mediums working in acrylic and oil with the colored pieces. So let's learn a little bit about these sheep. So their scientific name is Ovis Aries. There are over 1,000 distinct breeds of sheep worldwide. The female sheep are called ewes, male sheep are called rams. They're the ones usually with, sorry, we are around, along the harbor. <laughs> um, the rams are the ones that have the horns on them. Um, babies are called lambs and a group of sheep are called a flock. Sheep are actually highly social and smart animals. They form strong bonds of family and friendships. Sheep also experience a wide range of emotions like humans do. They have the ability to feel angry, afraid, bored, sad, and happy. Sheep also have great memories and can recognize up to 50 other sheep's faces for years. Sheep, like goats, have rectangular pupils, and you can see that in that lower right-hand corner picture, which I think is quite fascinating. This allows them to see almost everything around them because they are prey animals. So by having the rectangular pupils, they're able to see in a wider range of vision to be able to watch out for their predators. Sheep also have an excellent sense of smell. They even have scent glands in front of their eyes and on their feet. Sheep have a groove in their upper lip that divides in half called a philtrum. This helps them to select the leaves and vegetation that they like to eat. Sheep do not have teeth in their upper front jaw. Instead, and you can see that in that top left picture, instead, the lower teeth press up against the hard upper palate of their mouth to break down their food. Sheep can also self-medicate with plants and other substances to prevent or treat disease. This painting is called Salt Spring Sheep by Robert Bateman and it was finished in 1991. Another session for Action Anxiety Day will be an interview with Robert Bateman by his son, John Bateman, about anxiety and the artist. Both Robert and John live in, on Salt Spring Island, so I thought this piece would be fitting for our lesson today. Here's a quote from Robert about sheep in general. Sheep are universally smiled upon as being unaggressive groupies. Their round, fluffy shapes and plaintive bleats contribute to the overall amusement as does their scatterbrained behavior as a, as, a, as a startled flock. The fact that one dog can control hundreds of sheep would indicate a somewhat latent intelligence on the part of the sheep. This lone female sheep, salt spring sheep, has a certain dignity, however, when observed one-on-one, -on -one, eye to eye. Artistically, of course, she is merely a circle in a square a simple, pleasing, abstract image. And this is actually how we're going to start our sketch today is with some of those simple shapes that Robert speaks about. Oftentimes we get stressed out as someone looking at a blank piece of paper as to how to start your picture. We all have something that we are apprehensive to draw, whether it's an animal or a car or a horse or a hand. If instead of that, sh that thing, you think of it in terms of the shapes that make up that object, it makes it a lot easier to draw. So for example, it's truly just a mindset. However, drawing circles and rectangles is certainly a lot easier than drawing a sheep. So if we break that down into easier, that sheep into easier shapes, it makes it a lot easier to draw. To start our shape, I've broken down the image into circles and rectangles. 
it can be a little bit odd to see your picture starting that way, but it is a way of getting down your placement and your size of your object. So I'm going to replicate those shapes that I've broken it down into so that we can uh, get a better idea of where he's going to be. So I'm going to start with a big round circle. You'll find that my circles are quite sketchy and that's okay because that's we're just getting started. I'm also noticing that the sheep's head is about halfway in the middle of the body. <laughs> there, if I lay my pencil through the middle, that's where that head is sitting. So I'm going to go in the middle of his body to start with another smaller circle. Now you'll notice that I placed this circle just slightly higher than the other one because that's what I'm noticing on this sheep here. So if I go straight across from the top of his head, I'm slightly above that sheep's body. The next thing I'm going to look for is the where, where the muzzle is. So the muzzle is where the nose and the mouth are attached on a animal. So you'll notice that in the composite shapes, there is this smaller head circle is broken down into quadrants and the muzzle is actually on the lower left quadrant. So again, that just helps me to decide where I'm going to put that. Then if I go straight down from that muzzle, that's where that one leg is, straight below it. And those legs are just broken down into rectangles. So I'm going to just throw in a couple of rectangles here. So this one's right underneath the muzzle. This one lines up, but it's to the right of it. And then if we look at this other leg over on this side, notice how it's slightly higher. It's actually sitting at about half of that leg because it's farther back. So that's how I'm going to start. Now, it does not look like a sheep yet, but it helps me to get started. It no gives me a starting point and knowing where to go from here. Once we have our basic shapes, we're going to go back to clean them up and look for the lumps and bumps and add more details as we go along. So what I'm going to do with my piece is I'm going to start refining some of those details. So we talked about the muzzle here being to the left of the quadrant. I'm noticing that it goes up on an angle and the top of that muzzle is a little bit skinnier than the bottom is. I'm also noticing the eye line. So if I go through the middle of his face, it comes to about here and his eye line is fairly high up on the face. It's probably about a quarter of the way so I'm going to lay, oh, look at that. Actually, the eye line is almost completely in line with the back of the sheep there. So that's gonna help me with the placement of that eye line. Now I know that the eye line is where the eyes are going to line up. I've got, because his face is turned, I want one closer to that side, but at about the middle of this side. Again, still doesn't look like a sheep, but we're gonna keep cleaning it up as we go along. The next thing I'm going to look for is those ears. So I'm finding that the ear is kind of a, I'm going to start with an oval shape. It's a little bit pointier. It's kind of a cross between an oval and a triangle. And the point of it is coming just above that body line. So let's go with around the eye line, a little bit higher than his back. That's one ear. And then this one is pretty tiny and it's a little bit smaller because it's coming forward. So it's slightly foreshortened and we're going to do another kind of triangle shape. Now this one is sitting right on the head and we can, and that's because his face is turned. What that's also telling me is that this, the back of the sheep is going to be a little bit higher because it's higher up than that ear. All right. Now let's look into the nose and the mouth. So we learned previously that they have a philtrum, uh, which is that center line underneath the nose, and that splits into two. So let's start with the nose first, and it's basically just a V shape. And then we've got the mouth of the sheep that is split in half where that philtrum is, and then a nice round chin there. This is looking a little bit more like a sheep. We're getting there. All right, now this guy has a big old double chin. We're going to give him a little bit of a chin here and bring it up. 
because I'm noticing that although I started with a circle, he's actually quite narrow. It comes up at an angle in this direction here, up towards that ear. Now this is starting to look a little bit more like a sheep. I'm going to bring in that eye a little bit, the side of the face. We've got the top of his head. We can tweak that ear a little bit that we talked about. So we started with that elongated elongated oval and added a little point to it. This one is here, a little bit pointier. I come in and here. So now that head is looking like a sheep. That's a great start. So now let's look at his body again. So again, very round. That one's easy to do. He kind of looks like a big old cotton ball here. Sorry, I'm fighting with my cords. Here we've got this coming out. And then it gets a little bit of a bump here. And then I'm going to come a little bit wider. So here's our big old sheep. And I think he's fitting quite well here. So I'm going to start refining and getting rid of a few of those lines. So once I know where my lines are, I can go back and start cleaning it up a little bit more and adding a few more details. Um, those guidelines were there just to help me get started, but now I can go back and clean up some of those extra ones. If I look down at his legs, what I'm noticing is that the top of the leg actually comes up into the body. There's the bottom of the body. And see how that leg goes a little bit higher? So I'm going to bring that up a wee bit. And I'm finding that the leg is a little bit skinnier in the middle and then wider at the bottom again. Now let's look at this leg. This one's tucked in behind the fur, so we don't want to bring it up into the body. But again, skinny in the middle, coming out again. So you'll notice that I'm keeping my finger on my picture so that I know where I'm looking at. Because oftentimes when I take my eyes off of the picture onto my drawing, it can I can get a little bit lost sometimes. So if I put my finger on it, I know exactly where to find myself again. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this back leg. And it basically lines up with the tip of that ear. So I'm going to go tip of the ear, straight down, looks like I'm in line there. We had talked about it being about half of that leg. Now I had moved the leg slightly, so I'm going to pull that back leg up a little bit. And again, wider at the top and the bottom, skinnier in the middle. And get rid of those extra lines. All right, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more to that nose and just fatten up where we're seeing some of the nostril there. We've got that chin. I'm gonna to start to clean up up in here. I wanna go into those eyes. I think those are really cool where they have those rectangular pupils on there. So I'm finding that the top of the muzzle is a little bit higher than the eyes. So I'm going to bring it up slightly. And then I want to make a rounded shape on those eyes. So the one that's facing us, I'm going to start with a circle. And then I'm going to add some of the corners there, kind of at a little bit of an angle. And then the rectangular Pupil. So I'm going to do that here. I wanted to make it a little bit larger so you could see what I was doing. Now the other eye on the other side of the face, because it's turned slightly, we're seeing it a little bit more foreshortened. So it's looking more like an oval than it is a circle. So that one's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to bring it more like an, like an angled like that, like an oval. So we're still going to get the corner of the eyes going there and there. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do on a smaller scale here. Let's go down here. So I'm getting a little bit of the corners of the eyes. And then let's put that cool little rectangle in there. I'm going to shade it in a wee bit so you can actually see it. And then let's go to the other one, which is going to be skinnier, a little bit more oval shaped. But we're still going to see a hint of that pupil there. Coolio. Okay, so again, let's clean up some of those lines that we don't need anymore. All right, so 
So at this point, we have drawn a detailed line drawing of our sheep. So you can kind of see from my example that I've got a majority of what I want on there. I've got all the outlines going on, all of the details that I wanted, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Let's go in and give it some shading and texture to make it look more rounded and textured. So value is how light or dark an object is. And you can see that the ra a range kind of at the bottom right hand corner of our image there. So adding different values help to add depth and dimension to our drawings, help it to look more three dimensional. When we just have a line drawing, which is the white of our paper, the black of our pencil, our object is going to look fairly flat. Think of kind of like a coloring book image, right? But as soon as we start to add those different shades of gray, that starts to make it look more rounded. So if we look at this little dude here, you will notice that he has a lot of highlight on this area. I'm gonna actually draw so you can see it. So there's all that light right in there. And then we've got a great big dark shadow here. But this whole side is also in shadow, not quite as dark as this. So what I can do is I can actually break my drawing up very lightly. I'm gonna sketch really, really lightly so I can erase those lines. But just to give me an idea of where some of those values are gonna be. So this is the light one that we talked about. I'm gonna get kind of a medium running around his face here. This was the big dark one underneath his chin, up towards his ear and then another medium kind of in here. So I would say medium, dark, and light. I put an L, an M, and a D, just so that when I go back to shade that in, I have a better idea of where those are going to be. Now texture is how an object feels. Creating texture in a drawing is done through a combination of values and line. So form is created by value it helps to make an object look three-dimensional and texture helps us to tell how that object feels so if you think about a sheep we it's not going to be really soft like a cotton ball is because he's got all these dirty bits on him and he's got pieces of grass and things hanging from his from his coat so it's not going to be soft um, but it is going to be very fluffy so we're going to see if we can kind of get some of that in so we're gonna pay attention to that light source. My light is coming from the top left-hand corner and we're gonna start shading that in a little bit. All right, so we're gonna start adding a little bit of texture to him. So we talked about where the darks were and where the lights were. So I'm gonna start shading it in. I'm keeping my pencil strokes really close together. And that's gonna to help to create a darker value. So we've created a small value bar on the bottom of that sheep diagram there. And that's kind of what you're aiming towards. You want to try and get at least five different values into your image. So if we were to compare that value bar to the image above, you could probably find all five of those values in there. So you, the more values you can incorporate, the more three-dimensional and realistic it's going to look. I'm seeing a really dark area in front of his eye. So I'm seeing it fairly dark on his face. That was one thing I did not mark down earlier, like I did on the body. But that's definitely something that I wanna pay attention to as I'm laying it in. You do wanna avoid pressing too hard with your pencil because that can make dents in your paper and make it really difficult to make any changes if you want to. And it can kind of give you that weird shiny look. Get a little bit on that nose too. Now the nose itself is quite dark. That's probably gonna be close to our number five value. Again, without pressing hard. And then the mouth, that top lip there is really quite light. It's got a little bit of dark on the inside. And then on the outside of it, behind it, that we had already talked about that that was gonna be a medium in value. So let's shade that in a little bit. So I am not blending my, my pencil strokes. That would work really well if I had, if he, this, instead of being a fluffy ball, was actually just a rubber ball or something, we would blend it and we would get everything nice and smooth. 
but because he's a sheep and he's got that that texture of his fur and his hide, we want to keep the lines a little bit more random and loose and we're not going to smooth them out as much as I would if I had a smooth object. So here's my darkest dark on the muzzle. See how there's a little line of light right there? So in order to make that show up, I'm going to make it beside it is a little bit darker. Now that ear is super dark, not quite as dark as the nose is, so that one might be about a number four. So notice how I'm kind of going back and referring to my value bar to decide how light or dark I need to make that area. So I know the deepest, darkest part of that ear is going to be kind of cupped like that. So where it's really dark, it's going, or where it's deepest, it's gonna get darkest in that area there. Same thing on this side, we know that deep dark part in his ear will be the darkest then we're gonna get a little bit lighter kind of a medium tone and we're gonna try and leave a little bit of that light around it now right now I've got a bit of a dark edge so what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna try and go a little bit darker around it so that it's gonna leave me with a light edge of that ear and if that doesn't work I'm gonna come back with my handy eraser now You'll notice that I cut my eraser at a sharp angle and that's so that I can get into these teeny tiny little spots up here. So I'm gonna lighten up around the outside edge of that ear so that when I shade behind it, it's gonna pop forward a little bit more. See how that's working? See now my ear is light against a darker background instead of dark against a lighter background. And then again, we go quite dark in here. And I'm finding that the fur is a little bit longer on his body than it is on his face. And that's quite common for most animals. If you have a pet at home, that's, you might want to take a peek at how their fur works, where it's shorter, where it's longer, and what direction that it goes. Because it's kind of interesting. Cats especially have got a lot of really cool um, patterns of fur going in all sorts of directions especially on their face so this is going to be my darkest this was going to be i don't want this super light right now i'm still at the white of the paper so i know that i need to shade that in a little bit so robert when he's doing his sketching while he's out in nature often just works with a pen and a sketchbook when he's doing obviously more finished drawings like what we're doing right now he would use a pencil uh, and spend a little bit more time on it whereas a sketch while he's out in nature is very quick and scribbly and it's just to really get information down on paper and record his surroundings and what he's seeing while he's out there if you ha are spending a little bit more time on your image that's where you can get a little bit more refined all right so i know that i want to have this area a little bit longer fur a little bit medium in value i want it i know that i want this part to be the lightest so let's go really light in here i'll come back and erase that l later so i want this area here maybe about a two if i look up on my screen i'm kind of seeing anywhere from a one to a two in that area so i'm going to keep it fairly light again making my fur a little bit longer I'm seeing this interesting curve right in here that comes around the leg. See how it kind of creates the suggestion of that hip on the animal. I'm gonna actually make it a little bit wider up at the top so it gets narrower at the bottom. And then I know I want this area a little bit. So this was the lightest, a little bit darker. This is going to be similar. This is maybe a, this might be a one and this might be a two. So I'm going to make my two a little bit darker. And I'm noticing that it's not completely smooth. It's kind of patchy. There's areas of dark and areas of light all in one section. And I think that's what's going to make his fur look really loose and, and shaggy looking. So he doesn't become this really smooth, well-groomed shape because we know he's not. So that's so now we've got our zero, we've got our one, we've got our two. Let's go to about three in here. 
So it's going to be a little bit darker than what my number one was. And I'm also finding that in this shadow area here, I'm losing some of the detail. So up in here where I'm seeing more contrast between lights and darks, I'm seeing more detail in the fur. But over here where I've got basically mediums against mediums, it's getting more, more uh, blurry looking. And that's just because it's got less contrast. And it's because it's rounding the corner of that sheet because he's a round form and it's going back into shadow. So in shadow, we tend to lose a little bit of texture. So here's our number three. I'm gonna get it down. Again, notice I'm, I'm going fairly scribbly right now. If I were trying to get it done in about an hour, so obviously if I had more time, I would spend a little bit more time looking at the texture of that fur and how I can create it and clean it up a little bit more. But for right now, I think this is a good start. It's definitely looking like a sheep. It's looking a little bit furry instead of like, like wool. So I might need to go back and tweak those details a little bit more. But now we're seeing some of those textures and a little bit of the form on his body. We want the legs to be darkest. Again, the legs are gonna be short little fur, very similar to what we had on the head. Not nearly as long as the fur on his body is. We talked about this one being in behind the fur. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of break up that line a little bit. And then I'm gonna come back with my sharp eraser. And that's what that point is for, is I'm gonna actually pull a little bit of the lighter fur over top of that leg. Same thing here, notice how there's a couple little straggly pieces of fur overlapping that leg. That's gonna create some depth. Let's pull some down, and I'm gonna work in between a little bit, some negative space. So that's gonna start kind of getting that leg back into his body a wee bit more. All right, so we'll just tweak a little bit more. I'm not gonna to spend too much more time on it. I could spend hours on this and get it a lot more three-dimensional and furry looking. Another thing that I'm noticing is he has a lot of these patterns of almost like rings. And that's just the way his body is sitting and his fur is sitting on his body. So I'm gonna go find a few areas like that and go a little bit darker. So again, remember, the more values you have, the more realistic and three-dimensional it's gonna look. So that value is probably about a number four, where we get some of those indentation and rings. And it's not actually darker fur, it's a shadow on the fur. And that can be just as dark as anything else. So even though we think of sheep as being white, look how many values we've got in this guy. And he is technically a white sheep. We can see that in that original photograph. He's certainly not gonna be pure white, but you'll notice that color doesn't necessarily affect the values. It will help, it will affect it a little bit, but not completely. So if we just made him a big white cotton ball, he would look very flat. So by adding some dimension and adding some shadow, he starts to look more three-dimensional. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit darker in here. And then, now I had little markings on here too. If I wanted to create a little bit of this background and I wanted a smooth background, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep my pencil strokes really long, but also close together again. The closer together your marks are, the smoother you will be able to get your background. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. I can blend it with my finger, which is what I normally do. Or you can also come back with a Kleenex or a cotton ball. That would also work to smooth out the background. So see how that's starting to get me that kind of sky in the background? Now what I'm noticing in Robert's image is that it's darker at the top 
and lighter as we go farther down. So that's what I'm going to do on my image too. I'm finding that it's still pretty dark up here. So if I want to darken it, I just layer it some more. And then it will gradually start to get a little bit lighter as it comes farther down. So we want to get that nice, soft transition of values from dark to light. So very similar to our value bar, just blended really nicely. So I see how that kind of smooths it out a little bit there. And I, again, I can keep going back and layering it some more. And then we're seeing in the foreground, he's sitting in the snow. So it's going to be lightest, brightest at the front with a few of the shadows here. So the way I'm going to do that is actually very similar to the way I did my background. I actually want a little bit of tone on there very lightly because it gives me something to work with. I can actually then use my eraser as a drawing tool to come back and add some of those lumps in the snow. So I'm going to bring it a little bit farther down. Again, I'm going super light. I'm probably around a number one right now in value. And then I'm going to come back with my eraser again. This time I'm going to use the rounded edge because I want a bigger area. And I'm going to start drawing in some of those light lumps of snow that are sitting over top, layering in front of that sheep in his feet in the snow. See how it's starting to create? That would work really well for clouds too. Um, and then I'm going to, in order to make that show up more, notice how dark that shadow is underneath his, underneath his body and underneath his legs. That's a cast shadow. So I'm going to cast my shadow into that snow to make it push back a little bit farther. So again, when I'm trying to make something look smooth, I try and keep my pencil strokes as close together as possible so that when I blend it, it looks smoother. Not quite as important when we're working on something with texture like that sheep fur. And then I'm seeing a little bit in behind here. Again, the cast shadow from this leg is casting it that way. And then we've got a little bit of the body shadow here. And then a little bit over here as well. So notice I'm kind of going back and forth and back and forth. I put in some, some pencil shading, then I went back with my eraser, and now I'm going back with my pencil shading again, and I'll probably go back with my eraser again. So sometimes you have to go a little bit back and forth and back and forth to get the, the results that you're looking for. Okay, so I think that'll do for my shadows. And I'm going to come back and add some more of that snow. This is where I'm going to go a little bit more particular with the pointy edge of my eraser. To get that point, I use an X-Acto knife. Don't use scissors because it's going to mangle your eraser. But you can use an X-Acto blade and just cut it in one slice like you would be slicing cheese. Same idea. Oh, look, and then there's a little bit of a shadow in here. In behind that little lump. there. A little bit of highlights in the snow on the background. And I think we're getting pretty close. What you're going to find is that things that are closer to us, closer to the front, closer to the viewer, is going to have more contrast between lights and darks and more texture. As it goes farther back into the distance, it's going to get a little bit blurrier, a little bit more medium and less contrast. All right, so this is a very, very, very quick example of how I would sketch my sheep. Again, if you have more time, please take the time and go in and add a little bit more details and more fur. You don't have to do it as rushed as I did. I would normally spend many, many, many more hours on a sketch, depending on how much detail I want to put in. 
kind of gives you an idea of where I'm going. I would still like to put a little bit more texture on there. What I would do if I was spending more time, I would start to refine my lines a little bit more. And I could come back and put some of those little pieces of straw in and so on. So I would spend a lot more time layering that, but that gives you a fairly good idea as to where we are going. So you've now learned some of the basics of sketching. We've talked about lines, we've talked about shapes, we've talked about values, we've talked about textures. You've got a lot of information that I've thrown at you in this short period of time. I would like you now to take these skills that we've talked about and I want you to go outside into a nature space that's near you. Find a quiet place to sit that's kind of away from the traffic, away from a lot of the noise of the everyday world. And I want you to sit quietly in one spot. I want you to close your eyes and pay attention to your senses, the sounds that you hear, the smells, the feelings that are around you. So do you feel the wind blowing your hair? Can you feel the moisture of the grass below you? Can you feel the heat from the sun on your face? So I really want you to just focus on all of your senses in the area that's around you, all of your surroundings. When you open your eyes, I want you to look around, look up, look down, look far away and look close up and take in your surroundings like you're taking an inventory. What do I see around me? Now I want you to focus on something small and simple that catches your eye that's close by. And I want you to simply record your thoughts, your experiences, and your feelings of your experience while you're out in nature. Whether that's through words or symbols or through some sketching of your object. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. So if we look at the quote by Robert Bateman, it says, if you find yourself worrying, go outside, take three breaths, address a tree, and quietly say thank you. If you can't find a tree, a dandelion will do. Nature is magic, and we truly believe that. So whether it's a sketch of a lonely little dandelion or a beautiful scenic of a mountain Whatever you see and whatever you want to experience, think about that, acknowledge it, observe it, and record it in any way that you feel appropriate for you because this is just about you and your experience while you're out in nature. Thank you for joining us to sketch today. I hope that you enjoyed yourself. I hope you found it relaxing and I hope you learned a few new things. If you enjoyed this session, please visit us at batemanfoundation.org for more information about our programs. We do offer in-person and online programs for all ages and ability levels, to families, to individuals, to schools, and to special groups. We would be more than happy to even custom design a program for you. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.